A guy like Nelson, shit, I would have threw him in because I know <laughs> bad dude, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you know, some guys are like that. Guys like Noel Lomachenko. Man, what? Yeah. Three, four hundred amateur fights. Yeah. Shit. Physically strong, talented, skilled. Hell yeah, you can move that guy. You can you can move that guy real fast. Casa Zoo. You know, remember Casa Zoo? Yes. Yeah, the Australian fighter, yeah. Oh. Son of a, what he a was puncher tough. he was. He was tough, oh. wasn't he? But I, when he was in the amateurs, I saw him fight. You know, Vernon Forrest, remember Vernon? Vernon Forrest, Vernon. yeah, great fighter. Tall, rangy fighter. He beat the shit out of Vernon at the U.S. Uh, no, the, at the, the World Championship 1991. Watch it, watch it on the video. Uh, YouTube. Vernon Forrest versus uh, Casa Zoo. Casa Zoo was like a pro, man. He was like a pro with like 30 fights. Uh, when he was in the amateurs, okay? Pro style, physically strong, athletically gifted, reflexes. He had it all. When he turned pro, you could move that guy fast, man. You could get him into 10 round fights within five fights because he had all the physical gifts and uh, and the amateur experience, you know, where he didn't need 40 pro fights. You know, you could move him fast. And that's what they did. Oh, that Casa Zoo. He was probably the best, one of the one of the best amateurs I ever seen, man. When I saw him in the amateurs, like, man, this dude, yeah, this dude, man, this dude could be champion. But back then, I didn't know that, you know, you could move him that fast. And they did. A guy named Bill Morley, a uh, promoter out of uh, Australia, signed him. He gave him 80000 signed him back then in the uh, term pro. And, you know, within five fights, he was fighting 10-rounders. Yeah, he's fighting some bad dudes over there. Yeah, yeah, that that because he he had natural God given power, and he's got all that amateur background. He knew how to adjust to any style because he fought every style in the amateur, and he, you know he had all the physical gifts. You know the hand speed, the punching power, the reflexes, the footwork, and all that experience, the instincts. What the fuck, you need forty fights for that guy or thirty True. fights? Yeah, you move him, man. You know what I mean? You hold a guy back like that, you're ruining his career. You you mm. move now, which which is yeah. which happens a lot nowadays, doesn't it? People are sort of waiting waiting for that big money fight instead of going and taking those fights early when they clearly got the talent and the ability to do so. Well, guys, you know me, they move guys too fast. I'm gonna give you an example. Oh, that guy number one in the world, the WBA featherweight, awesome. He's from Uzbekistan, I think. Check him, look him up. He's number one in the world. Joel Diaz trains him. Okay, he's 13 okay. fights. He's number one in the world by the BA. He's fighting Raymond Ford, who's number two in the world. 14 and 0. <laughs> Man, back in the days when I started, them guys would be no more than eight round fighters. They would, you know what I mean? But now they're they're microwaving them. They're moving them fast. And that and that Uz, Uzbek guy, I can't remember his name, man. Cause he fought up here in Mexico, in Mexico, uh, in my hometown, hmm. two months ago, October. Yeah, he fought a tune-up. Uh, they brought him up here and fought a tune-up. Uh, you know, it's not on box rec because they didn't put it up there. But I was oh, there. Yeah. All right, he he fought he fought right before my guy, and I know Joel Diaz, and uh, and they were telling me they were going to fight for the title. So I wanted to check him out. Man, I do. You can see he had a big amateur background. He fights that European, you know, di range and distance style. And he do a lot of combinations. And he's physically strong. He can punch. That four better be ready, man. Because this sucker can punch. But he's raw and green. You know what I mean? He just, he's like, you know, a robot. You, you wind him up and let him go. He's raw <laughs> and green. But he fought this guy, this tough Mexican I knew up here. Indian Mexican, not a European. And this guy, dark skin, Mexican, tough leather skin. You hit him with your best shots. They never mark up. So like it sounds Jose like um, sounds like baby Alice Mendy. <laughs> or Jose Luis Ramirez. Remember him? Yeah, yeah. Before, um, but now we should go twice, certainly. Yeah, or he fought Chavez. He fought Chapo Rosario. He yeah, he had a great record as shot. well. Ramirez. Ramirez had a great record, didn't he? Over 100 wins. Yeah. He fought all the time. He came up the hard way over here, you know, fighting for fifty dollars for fights and all that. But he had that he had that skin where you can hit him with your best shots. They never marked up. 
solid chin. It's that Aztec Indian, you know, uh, DNA in them. And that that Uzbek, Uzbekistan guy fought fought Ho Ho Joel Diaz. And that guy had us. That guy's record was seven and fourteen. Now, at the weigh-in, I told Joel, "Hey, man, you're in a tough fight, man. Don't." And they all looked at me. But they thought it was going to be seven and fourteen. It's going to be a two or three round fight. Hmm. So you're in a tough fight, man. And Joel looked at me. You know, he was just. <laughs> You know, he didn't know. Well, he found out real quick because that guy, that 7 and 14 guy was in that guy, his fighter's face the whole eight rounds. That guy was, that Joel Diaz fight was, Joel, Joel Diaz's fighter was hitting him with his best shot and the guy just kept coming, taking it and firing back. After eight rounds, he finally stopped him. But with the cops, wow. his face was all marked up. You heard his hands. Yeah, wow. I didn't think it was going to be a tough fight like that. So over here in Mexico, you never judge a book by his cover. You can True, read his yeah. box rec, but you got to know how to read his box rec. You understand? He was yeah. 7 and 14. He was a tough, physical, rugged 7 and 14. I knew the yeah. guy. I see him around here. So yeah, it reminds him, me. Um, it reminds me of speaking to um, Billy Briscoe and Billy Padden from Philadelphia, both of those um, great coaches. And they mentioned back in the day, a lot of the Philly fans have rushed too quickly as well. So the, the record may not show you know, that you know, they're great, but they actually... They, they are great fighters because they've been fighting in those Philly gym wars and they've been rushed too quickly against good fighters as well. Um, so the record may have suggest they're good, but you know, when you come up against them, you know you're in for a fight, which is why Philly, I suppose, has a, a great great reputation, doesn't it, for producing uh, top fighters. Russell Pelt, you could thank him. He's Russell Pelt, yeah. He resurrected yeah. boxing back in the 70s, yeah. Because Philly was yeah. pretty much a dead market. Russell came in there told him what time it was, and he started building the renaissance of Philly boxing. Yeah, they, all them great champions he had. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Eddie Eddie Franklin. Oh, um, Eddie. Matthew Franklin. Oh, yeah, Matthew Saad Muhammad. Matthew Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, uh, Jeff Chandler, you know, WBA Bantamweight champ of the world, uh, Bam Bam Hines. You know they had some good, they had some great champions because of Russell. He created that culture of toughness, attitude, toughness. Okay, uh, he created that uh, with that culture where the best fought the best. Hagler, you know, you heard about Hagler's had to go there going, twice and lost. Going through Philly, yeah, he fought. Hagler was tough, wasn't he? Went straight to Philadelphia and fought all their best guys, didn't he? In their hometown, Boogaloo yeah, Watts yeah. and. And who's the other guy? God, Benny Briscoe as well. Benny, Benny Briscoe. Briscoe. Yeah. He, 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 yeah, he lost both of them. And I, and um, him in the Willie, de, Willie de Wern Monroe as well. Willie de Wern Monroe, yeah. Philly had a lot of top fight. Man, Philly is a fight town. I fought yeah, there. Yeah. I don't know. That's a fight town. I fought there, I don't know, long 13 years ago or so like that. Man, it's it, just the fans there. African Americans are fight fans over there, man. They buy tickets. They they know they're very knowledgeable. You can't bullshit yeah. them, and they want good fights like Mexicans. You know what I mean? But yeah. like I said, uh, we were going back to fighters being rushed. Yeah, I seen that back in the days too. They did that with Sh James Shuler. You remember him? James Shuler fought Thomas Hans. I got knocked out. He was twenty five yeah. and zero. Yeah. I remember Willie Rush. An old time, old school trainer from Philly. He trained Meldrick Taylor in the amateurs. Real good okay. trainer. Uh, he was telling me, man, yeah, man. They should have never took that fight. They were rushing. They, you know, he, even though he was twenty five and zero, they should have waited another year before before fighting Tommy because they, you know, he was he might have been twenty five and zero, but he was on the, he wasn't near ready to fight a guy like Thomas Hearns, who was pretty mm -hmm. much in his prime. Yeah, Willie, he was a good trainer, man. Willie Rush. Whew. From Philly, ask your ask your contacts from Philly if they heard of Willie Rush. I've been around him, man. Uh, I was with him when he was training a guy named James Page, the WBA champion, and it was in Houston. He was training up there, and I got to know him and everything, and talk, started talking to him every day at the gym. And man, this guy, I started, this guy knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's yeah, doing. yeah, around. Philly's yeah, Philly's got a lot of great coaches, a lot of great fighters, and it's just a, a great boxing city, isn't it? Only thing they're missing, they're missing one thing. What are they missing? The world champion. A promoter. 
Russell's not doing shows here no more. You can't, you can't, you can't make a big, you can't make a boxing uh, market hot like Philly without a promoter that knows what he's doing. Champ, fighters over there can't be. It's hard to, you know. It's, it's, I don't give a shit how great, great a coach you are, or how much knowledge you know as a coach. Okay, and you, how, how great a talent you got. If you ain't got a promoter behind you. It's hard. To, it's hard to. It's hard to make it in boxing, man. I learned that. In, I learned that from Chargin in the days, man. And I worked with the, all his champions back in the days in Sacramento. Uh, Don Don Chargin, Hall of Fame boxing promoter. When I met him back in what eighty three, I watched him develop the market. Uh, Bobby Chacon became champion, and that was one of his guys. Then guys below him, Tony Lopez, Loretto Garza, Garza, Willie Jordan, they became champion later on. It was because of Don and his promoting, consistently cultivating, developing the market. From the four-round stage, the six, the eight, the ten, when they became ten-round stage fighters, they started becoming gate attractions. Once they started becoming gate attractions, TV wanted to be involved. Then that's when they became champions, okay? It's, it's a process. I've seen them, Don do it. Damn, they're ninety percent of their fights without TV club shows. Yeah, wow. and you need a. You don't see that in America no more. That's why boxing is pretty much on ICU in America. In Philly, oh, Philly's got a great. Philly, Philly is a damn good market. All them talented, young, hungry African American fighters. A lot of great trainers over there, man. A lot yeah. of good teachers, but they don't have no promoter. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now you make, like Boots Enos, man. He should be a, he should be a, 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 an icon. You know, drawing, selling out one of them big stadiums, fifteen, twenty thousand. But you don't see yeah. him fighting there. Okay, mm. he's got all the talent in the world, hasn't he? Oh, Enos. Oh. I remember him. He was like that in the amateurs, man. He was talented, and I remember him in the amateurs. He. He won the Golden Gloves that year. My, my guy won the Golden Gloves in 2015. He won the Golden Gloves the same year, yeah. Yeah. He was, oh, I can see his talent, but he didn't have a pro style back then. It was an amateur. When he turned okay. pro, then he started developing the pro style. Like, mm. better fighting in the pocket, sitting down on his punches better, getting better leverage. His, his trainer, his dad, excellent trainer. Yeah, Bozianis. Bozianis, Bozi yeah. I don't know what you guys. I never met the guy, but I could tell he was a. I, can, I know the way he developed the son, how from the amateurs yeah. and how much he improved in the pros, how he took him from that transition from here to there. Because Enos, he was getting beat by Antoine Gary Antoine Russell, Gary Russell's brother. He got, oh yeah, he couldn't he couldn't handle that heat. The Anton Russell, strong physical fighter, would put it on him. He didn't he couldn't handle that heat. Yeah, and now he's developed the all around skill sets. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, but I, I think um, Ennis needs that sort of big name, big fight to raise his game to another level. Because I think it's in him. He just needs the right opponent to bring it out of him, and then I think everyone will sort of know what, sort of confirm what everyone sort of in Philadelphia knows that he's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he's going to be a multi-weight world champion. I, I believe um, he, yeah, he, sh but... he should be. He should be. Oh, without a doubt. But the thing is, if he if he became a natural draw in, in Philly. Where he's packing the stadium, where he's packing the arena, or taking it over to the you know the Eagle Stadium and packing it over there, he'll have the leverage to draw those big name fighters. Right now, he ain't got no leverage because he's on the verge of becoming a big draw, but he's not a big draw. He should have been a big draw by now, man. If they yeah. did it right, man. Cameron Duncan and uh, uh, when he they should have did it, they should have done it the Don Charter way. Just kept promoting him in Philly, building his fan base up. So right now he he sell out uh, the big basketball arenas there, fifteen twenty thousand. Take it, you know, it, he he would be so big they would have to take it to that football stadium where he'll draw he'll draw thirty thousand people, forty thousand. That's how good the kid is, and he's charismatic. He's got a good personality. He's got a good story. He could do that. Now when he gets that kind of drawing power, hey, you know, then all the other top dog knows there's going to be the resources. The money they want to fight that guy. Nobody's gonna want to fight that guy. Who the hell wants to fight that guy? There ain't no money in it, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean that guy's yeah. that guy's a hundred percent risk. 
Zero percent reward, man. It's a bad dude at Enos, man. Whew. Yeah, great fire. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's quite interesting. You mentioned um, the Don the Don Chargin way about promotion of fighter. So so he would make a fighter really well known in the hometown, build his profile up, and then take him out. Mm. Look, John Don started promoting fights in fifty one. I met Don in eighty three, but he was promoting fights in eighty uh, fifty one. Okay, that's he's he take local guys, build them up in their home area, like in in uh, the Bay Area, Santa Clara. Don ruled Northern California, baby. Santa Clara, San Francisco, Oakland, Stockton, all the way to Fresno, Sacramento, uh, all the little towns. Santa Clara. Don was a man, man. If you if you talk to anybody back then, man, even Andre Ward. You know Andre Ward, the fighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he even went up to Don one time. He goes. I heard you were the man back in my days in, in, in Oakland. You were the man. And Don, you know, was humble. He goes, yeah, I, I promoted a lot of show. Because Don opened up the Oakland uh, Auditorium where the, where the uh, Oakland Arena, where the, where the Warriors the Warriors used to play. His first fight there, he sold it out. Over 14,000 people, he told me, back in 66. Yeah, or something like that. Wow. And, and Don used to do a lot of shows in Oakland where it was hot. Boxing was hot, man. Cause he was a man. Don was doing, you know, he was doing shows, and and Don would take kids from the local markets and make them hometown heroes. So we moved when he moved to Sacramento. It was like riding a bike at the Olympic Auditorium. I told you, Don started uh, when he was getting hot as a promoter coming up in the fifties. He got hired by Miss Eaton, Eileen Eaton, who was running the Olympic Auditorium, and she hired Don for his matchmaking and uh, and his. Uh, what do you call it? Consulting. So he hired him and his wife, Lorraine, who's also in the Hall of Fame, who did a lot of shows on her own. And they started promoting shows back in 64, 1964 at the, at the Olympic Auditorium in L.A. They did one show a week for 20 years straight. Wow. One show. That's a thousand shows. But get this. During that, during the, during the week, there were so many fighters, Don told me, that wanted to fight at the Olympic because the Olympic was like the mecca of boxing on the West Coast, okay? Madison Square Gar Garden was the mecca of boxing on the East Coast. It was before fucking Vegas. Vegas wasn't even big, man. Not until uh, it was Olympic. Everybody wanted to fight there. Ali fought there. Frazier fought there. Hagler fought there. Oliveras. Every, every Hall of Fame guy you ever... No one boxing back then fought there. And Don would do the shows once a week. And uh, while he was doing them shows once a week, there were so many fighters that couldn't fight on the shows, but Don had to keep everybody active. So he promoted shows all in, he, during the week, he would promote two or, three, two or three shows extra in the Southern California area, like in San Bernardino, Riverside, uh, Hollywood, you know, different parts of LA, since it was such a big market. The same time he was doing the shows at the Olympic and his wife would do shows in Northern California, in the Bay Area, Sacramento, Fresno, Stockton. So they were doing like three to four shows a week wow. for 20 years. <laughs> Could you imagine that? It's amazing, that's a, isn't that's it? a, man, that's a Hall of Famer, man. Nobody's ever done that. Yeah, Don told me all these stories, man. Yeah. I, and you know, I was like, damn, man. I said, he goes, that's why I got a heart attack, James, in the 70s, because I was so overworked, you know, doing three, oh, four yeah. shows a week. He was promoting, yeah, because there were so many fighters back then. He didn't, you know, like nowadays, what happens if you don't fight? You stay up, you, nobody's promoting shows, and you sit on the shelf. Back then, nah, not, not with none. He cultivated all these, you know, all the fighters that couldn't fight at the Olympic or weren't ready to, he would cultivate them in all these club shows, and the guys that stood out, Don would, uh, what do you call it? Promote them to the Olympic. <laughs> okay. That's how, you know, you got, you had to earn that right to fight at the Olympic. He didn't give you no free pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even if you fought in Northern California, if you did good there, hey, then you're invited. Yeah, man. It's <laughs> but Don did that for like 20 years. So when he got to Sacramento, when he started cultivating the market in Sacramento, his wife did shows in Sacramento before, uh, before Don started going full time with her, she used to do shows all the time. She told me she used to do sometimes up to 12, 12 13,000 people, yeah, paid ticket wow. sales. So, so, so yeah. 
what, what did you learn? What, what, what's, what was something that you sort of sticks out, what you learned most from being with Don? This is what real boxing is about, the 80s. You talk to Aram or Chargan, they'll tell you. They told me. The 80s was the last golden years of boxing, meaning boxing was on network TV, shown to the masses. Not like now. You got a good fight. They put it on fucking pay-per-view. Mm. Okay, when you okay, see, when you got fights on network TV every week back then, okay, uh, it's shown to the masses. Everybody sees it. Yeah. Okay? It, it, you know, if this, when there's good fights... People tune in. People get excited. New fans are created. Nowadays, shit. You got a good fight that put it on pay-per-view and, and the market shrinks. Okay? Yeah. It ain't shown to the masses. It's shown to the few who want to pay that 80, 90 bucks. You know, but Don, back in the days, most important night, the thing I did was the importance of a promoter. Okay? Uh, you can have a, the greatest fighter in the world, but if you ain't got the promoter, right promoter behind them. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go nowhere because the right promoter is not going to get you the right fights to develop you, to get you better every fight. Okay. You need fights, man. You need the right promoter that's going to develop you up the level, up the, st uh, up the stages, up the levels. Okay. To the top, from the bottom to the top. And Don, that's probably the main thing I learned. That's where I learned the business from. You know what I mean? From the club shows and how we built yeah. the uh, fighters from the, from the four rounds all the way to the championship level. Okay, and you did it with local guys, I, and I'm not talking about the greatest talent, uh, you know, that guys like King or top rank sign. I'm talking about local guys that nobody wanted, guys like Tony Lopez, Loretto Garza, Guillermo Joran, okay, Bobby Chacon won the title over there, the second, okay. uh, I think second or third. Then Don had two other guys that fought for the title over there, Richard Duran and Juan Lascano. Then Diego Corrales came in, came out of that area too, you know, because he used to train with me. Oh yeah, I used to, shit. I used to used to train with us. I used to train him and his, I used to help oh, wow. his dad out with it. Yeah, I, I remember wow. Diego's first fight when he was ten years old. Ten year old amateur. He was a little kid. He lost to a kid. His dad put him in a fight with a guy with over 25, 25 amateur fights. Little for his debut. Little, yeah, first debut, and and, and wow. he got stopped in the second round, so he was crying and everything. He was a little little bitty kid. I walked him over. Hey, it's gonna be all right. But I seen Diego's development in in the amateurs, and mm -hmm. when he was fourteen, his dad brought him over to the gym and uh, wanted me to help him out. You know, so I started helping him out. We won a national title together, in fact, in '95. Wow. Yeah, he was number one talented kid. Oh, you can yeah, see his yeah. talent. But that's what I learned from Don. Uh, was the importance of the. Government.